Your book is amazing. I feel like we should applaud for the book. Thank you. And my favorite part is how right in the beginning it acts as a manifesto of sorts because I feel like as somebody who herself has had depressed, depression and like anxiety, it can be really hard to pick yourself up and to like look at the big picture and decide that it's something that you're gonna survive in this moment or you're gonna get through. Um, did you kind of, did you go into this thinking of it as a manifesto or did you go into it thinking as part of your own, your own personal manifesto? Um, the idea of being furiously happy was absolutely something that was my personal manifesto. It, it came about way before the book um, when I was dealing with a lot of um, Depression, I was like in a very serious bout at the time and I lost two friends and I, for me, like depression hits people in different ways and for some people they get sad or for some people they cry or for me, I have absolutely, it's like a lack of emotions and it is extremely uncomfortable. I have no energy and I just feel worthless. Uh, and so that's kind of where I was. and. The only emotion that I had was anger, and I was angry that life had done this and that you have to go through so much bullshit just to live sometimes. And so that's when I decided I would be furiously happy and I would take the opportunities to any time that I had a moment to do things to make myself happy. And not as a cure for mental illness, and I always have to say that to people because so often people will be like, I'm glad you said this. All you have to do is just be happy. That's how you <laughs> fix mental illness. And I'm like, you have no, no idea how mental illness works. <laughs> That's not how that works at all. Instead, it was all about taking those, those moments so that I could take them back into battle with me when my head said, it would never be okay again, or I would never feel emotions again, or I would always be broken. I could remember, well, you know what? I remembered that last time, and that was wrong. So depression lies, and if it does lie, I'm gonna take these memories with me and use them to remind myself that it's gonna be okay again. There's always hope at the end, which I feel like this book has a huge message of hope to it. And even when you're dealing with like the reality of depression or the reality of anxiety or the reality of feeling like a crazy person, and I feel like only if you're a person who's dealing with that can you ever say that word, by the right. way. Um, I like it always had this like woven kind of this happened. This is like a chapter that's very real, like your Q and A with Victor. And then right away, there's like a chapter where it's like, but then I can be, you know, funny and have fun and be happy. Like I'm not. You're not defined by it, and you don't make the book defined by it. Right. Was that intentional to make it almost like mimic how an episode in life can look, or was it just the way the book kind of came together? Uh, it was a little bit of both. Um, it was organic in the sense that. Uh, it is more of a collection of essays rather than a memoir, um, but it, it really is very much what it's like inside my head of there's going to be a month when everything falls apart and I can't take a shower for a week at a time or, you know, the things are not going my way. And then there will be two days when something hilarious and fantastic happens and it just pulls me right up and those are the two days that I live for every month. And that, that always sounds like a depressing thing. Like it's like, ugh, she only has two good days a month. But really when you, when you look at your life, there's so much stuff of just, you know, this is how I survive. Like, okay, well I'm gonna, you know, here's my job and here's my work and I'm gonna, you know, be a mom and a wife and a, you know, all the things that I have to be. Um, but there are those moments that are ridiculous and hilarious and fantastic. And I tried to show that, that those moments exist no matter what, whether you deal with mental illness or cancer or you know, everybody into everyone's life, bad things are going to fall, but also really hilarious things. There, are two, there was two parts, the whole book made me wanna like take to the streets and be like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> um, one part I really liked was how you addressed imposter syndrome, the sense of 
you're doing a thing and like if you guys don't know what that is I'm sure you do but it's the idea that like you have that voice inside you constantly being like you're not good enough mm -hmm. and what you're doing is not good enough and everyone's gonna find out you're a fraud um, how have you actively told that voice to shut up because it's a long process it, it is um, and I sort of feel like it's maybe a never-ending process for some people including myself um, one of the things that I talked about was um, when I was working on the audiobook and I was so afraid, I was like, I completely screwed it up and they kept saying like, cut, cut, we can hear the terror in your voice and it was very obvious and like, I can even hear it. Like right now they would be like, cut, you sound scared. And I'd be like, I am scared, people are looking at me. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> no, I'm in, I'm in my own little box, it's fine. And. Um, Neil Gaiman, I sent him a, a text and I was like, okay, well, what do I do? <laughs> like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screw this up and I know they're calling Betty White right now to replace me and I don't know what to do. And he said, just pretend you're good at it. And I did it. And I walked out and I pretended that I was good at it. And the producer let me get through an entire paragraph without stopping me. And she was like, I don't know what you just did, but keep doing it. And I was like, I just did a lot of cocaine. And, uh, <laughs> and then she, I was like, no, I, I got some good advice. But I still, like, you can still, you can see it on me. I write it before I go out. I write, pretend you're good at it constantly. Well, you know, I'm actually really very lucky because, um, first of all, my community has saved me on more than one occasion. Uh, it's, not, it's not unusual for me to be stuck alone in a hotel room or stuck in a bathroom and be thinking like, I can't, I can't leave this bathroom. Like I'm having a panic attack. I cannot even get out far enough to get my medication. I'm going to be stuck here forever. And I get on Twitter and there are a thousand people out there saying like, you're not alone. You're okay. Let me show you a picture of my cat. Let me show you, you know, let me, I'm going to send you a, a video or something that's going to make you laugh. And, um, and they're there. And what's also really lovely is how many people have come through, especially um, during the signings, who have come through and they have the book signed and they say, uh, I found this book because my daughter gave it to me and said, this is what I'm going through and I'm going to kill myself. And I read this and I decided not to because if everybody feels like this, then maybe there's hope for me. And so many people out there are getting help and are realizing that they, they don't have to feel terrible all the time, that they deserve to have happiness in their life. When I was a kid, I had already had severe anxiety disorder. So even as a child, I was not able to uh, communicate properly to people. And I didn't have any real friends and um, I couldn't do you know, sleepovers or summer parties or any of that because I would panic. And um, so my, my friends were books. And so I would read and so I would be like, this is Laura Ingalls and she's my best friend and here. And I would, you know, know all of these, these stories. And my only way of um, really outwardly communicating was in writing. And so I always wrote journals and diaries and they basically were like pen pal things to me because right. I didn't have a pen pal.